Hi friends, my name is Cody Archer and I want to welcome you to this week's Revive Live. I'm so excited that you're joining us and we're going to have an amazing conversation. I say this almost every week, but I have two incredible pe people with me today and you're going to love our conversation. We want to talk about the Israeli army and what is it like to be a believer in the army. And so we have two of our team members from here in Revive Israel who have recently come out of the army and so we're going to hear about some of their experiences what was it like in the army, some of the challenges, difficulties, and then I want to have them give you some keys on how to be praying for believers in the army and really soldiers in general. So I want to introduce today, we have Sarah Zingerman and Rafael Almeida, and I love both of you guys, like I said before. <laughs> um, both of you are worship leaders, you're passionate about the Lord, both of you are serving among young people, there's so many different things that are on your hearts, and it's a joy for me to serve alongside you. Uh, so welcome, thanks for your time with me today. Thank you. Thanks for having but I want to jump in. Both of you uh, immigrated from foreign countries in your teenage years to Israel with your families. And so I want to just take a minute. Let's hear what was that experience like for both of you. Let's start with you, Sarah. You came from America. There's some other stops along the way. But what was your experience like immigrating as a teenager? Well, um, so like Cody said, I was 14 when we moved to Israel. And that's a very key turning age when you're growing up, you're walking out, finding who you are as a young woman, as a young man. And it was um, very different than what I expected. I had no grid in my mind for what it would be like to land in a new country, a new language, a new culture, a new society. Um, I had basically also been homeschooled my whole life and then put into public school in a new language where specifically the area we moved to no one spoke English so we were forced to instantly just learn Hebrew as best as we could by sitting in class and trying to copy things from the board um, and at first it was full of a lot of emotions because I was very excited to move here and I'd always felt called to live in Israel speak Hebrew serve my people but after a couple days the excitement starts to go down <laughs> and also at school the first day you show up you're the famous American girl and everyone's so yeah. excited to just like see you and talk to you and then they realize you actually can't talk to them you don't speak their <laughs> language and after the first couple of days people just like leave you alone and then there's a lot of loneliness wow. a lot of uh, not being able to communicate so no friends um, not really knowing how to even break through the circles that kids make in school at that age and uh, it was a year of just intensely leaning on the Lord, praying, even a lot of tears, a lot of crying, and, and working things through with my family. We became a lot stronger in that season because my parents were able to walk me and my siblings through it and just prepare us each day for the challenges we would face. Wow, that's good. Yes. Now, Raphael, you probably had a similar experience. I, I just want to ask one question to both of you. Yes. Did either of you visit Israel before your families actually made Aliyah? No. Both of you, it was the first time just showing up in a brand new country? I had visited twice before. Twice, okay. Oh, okay. So did, did either of you have kind of that idea like in Israel there's like camels and people wear those yes. old school clothes? This is what I wanted to say that uh, my experience was a little different from Sarah because I was eight years old and for me it was really easy. Uh, at first I thought that uh, is Israel is camels and pyramids and <laughs> everything is desert. And uh, so I was really exciting before. And then when we got there, uh, we live in a kibbutz. Kibbutz, it's, uh, it's really nice and uh, nature and you, it, you are really free there. So for me, it was really easy. I was really excited. Um, we were in like in a little house, uh, like you said, it, a ta good time for family. Uh, we really become strong family in this time, um, especially in the four uh, first years. But I was a child. For me, it was easy. I learned the Hebrew. Yeah, I didn't understand nothing, but I didn't notice this. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's good. It was good. Wow. Now, before we transition into talking about your experiences in the Army, I just want to ask you, as our friends watching and joining us right now, would you share and like this broadcast? I think what they're going to share over these next coming minutes are going to be really impactful and important. So go ahead, share and like this. And uh, also, go ahead and leave your comments. Give us your thoughts. What, what, do you, what are some ways that you think that we can be praying for soldiers in the Army and uh, some of your perspectives? Now, Sarah, let's start with you again. You're 18 years old. You get drafted into the army. Tell us about that experience. 
it was a completely new experience for me, for my family. We didn't know what the army was like. So I came sort of unprepared, but also I had walked through conferences that prepared believers to step into the army. So on a, an experiential level, I took it as a game. Basically, you walk into a new world where people yell at you and you have to run and you have to get in the dirt and you have to do crazy things you never thought you'd imagine yourself doing. And if you play the part properly, you just enjoy it. So I really enjoyed every single day of boot camp, despite the difficulties and wow. the yelling and tears of people around me. And it was supernatural, I think, that I could find joy in the midst of it. Wow. So what, then you get through your boot camp and they put you in a specific position. So what was that for you? Yeah, I was placed in the spokesperson unit, which is in charge of uh, passing on to the media everything that's published about the IDF in the news. Everything uh, about the army, articles, interviews, uh, news. And it's a very challenging battleground because you're working with people who are usually intensely against everything you bring and they're not interested in hearing even if it is truth mm -hmm. and then they take it and write it in their own words. Wow, interesting. So what about your experience in you know, training and what position did you get put into? Uh, so my position was a artillery combat soldier. Uh, we have eight months training and it was really hard, like physically, um, but it was really good because it's a good time to have friends. This friends, like, this is the only people that you're going to see. This is like the, they say. This is the only people that you're going to uh, continue, like, in a war or everything. So my good friends, they are still uh, from the uh, training. Mm. And uh, I really like it. It was hard because we didn't um, came home a lot, but... It was good. Wow. So did both yeah. of you carry machine guns with you through your army service? Yes. You it's did? It's not a machine gun. It's like a uh, M16. I don't M16. Know. M16. Yeah. Yeah. I'd classify that as a machine gun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Did you have to carry also? Uh, in boot camp and in training and then yeah. guard duty throughout okay. my service. Yeah. Okay. What is that like to carry a gun with you day and night for you know, months on end sometimes? It's really weird because I think we have the, the, the head of a foreigner. Like, we are Israelis, but we still have the... Mindset. Yeah. Uh -huh. And um, it was, sometimes I thought like a Brazilian, and I said, wow, I'm going home with a gun. And I'm taking and putting uh, under my pillow. It was really weird. But when you thought like Israeli, it was really like regular, and uh, it's normal. okay, it's normal, yeah. yeah. Wow, that's interesting. <laughs> yeah, it's really... So I want to hear also from both of you, give me one really positive experience that each of you had in the Army, and then also a really difficult one. For me, maybe one of the biggest highlights was actually during my training course to be a spokesperson. We each had to prepare a short five-minute lesson or lecture that we would share in front of everyone. And just something from our heart, maybe a hobby, something from our childhood. And I wasn't sure what to share, but as I was talking with friends from my boot camp, uh, they said, Sarah, you should really share about your faith. Hmm. It's a s huge part of who you are. And there's people here in the course that don't know it. They have to know about it. Mm. So I figured if I have my unbelieving friends telling me, I should probably be sharing about my faith. That's from yeah. the Lord. Wow. So I was able to just stand up. And the moment I stood in the classroom, I felt the Holy Spirit's presence enter the room. And it was almost a clash where I wasn't expecting it because I'm not in church or in a believing setting. I'm in the middle of the army, but I felt the Holy Spirit come and there was so much grace to just share in front of the entire course. It's about 60 soldiers plus officers and commanders, maybe about 70 people. Wow. And at the end of the five minutes, it broke into questions that went on and on and on and on. And people were so hungry, more than I expected. <laughs> Eventually, the officer had to stand up and say, OK, we can continue this question and answer time later. We need to move on. Wow, that's amazing. You know, I, I remember hearing about that story from some other people. And then also you told me. But since then, I can't even count on one hand how many other soldiers I've heard having similar experiences yeah. where they've come and had opportunities to share with 30, 60, up to 100 of their soldier, uh, fellow soldiers yes. about their faith in Yeshua. So the gospel is going out. It's spreading into the army little by little, and that's really encouraging. 
So Rafael, what about for you? What was a really positive experience? Uh, it's funny because I wanted to say the same thing. Oh, wow. Uh, in the last year, my officer asked me to give uh, for the younger uh, soldiers a lecture or something teaching about the faith. I even didn't choose. He said uh, that he can teach them about your faith. Wow. And it was 20 minutes. It's not five minutes. Uh -huh. And uh, the good thing that I was in a team of um, religious Jews, mm. and uh, they call Kipot Sulgot or um, nationalist. Yeah, nationalist uh, Judaism or something like that. Uh -huh. And there was really like we continue for 40 minutes um, our teaching because mm. they have because they learn a lot about the Bible and they have a lot of questions. And I pray before. Uh, that God gave me wisdom to answer them and God gave me uh, wisdom. I even gave one of them a uh, uh, New Testament. It was really exciting. Wow, that's awesome. That's encouraging. Yes. Now, Sarah, give us one of those days or an experience that was really tough for you. Um, probably one of the hardest ones was at the end of the course when they divide you up into what office you'll mm. be serving in for the rest of your time. And there was a specific area that I felt called to serve in. And I had been through an interview, passed the interview. It was clear that that's where I would go. And I went into the office, and they told me that I was going somewhere completely different that was not even on my radar. It was basically the worst office you could be put in, um, where nobody wanted to go. <laughs> and in that moment, I felt um, just struggle to trust in the faithfulness of God. Like, God, why would you give me this promise and then I get thrown somewhere else? Wow. Also, your brother has gone through something similar recently. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That is tough. And what about for you? Um, in the end of the training, I think it's the same thing. Uh, in the combat, you're staying with the same team, the whole service. But me, because they say that I'm special, I don't know why, but... We <laughs> this think you're is, special, too. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> they said that uh, I need to move to other team uh, in another, like, section of the Army. And it was really hard for me, especially that the first training is the, the best, like I said at first, that you bond with everybody there, and we, you want to continue all your life with them. And... The other team, it was a little different, but like I said, there was they were religious. Mm -hmm. So I, I felt from God that this is um, his call for me to talk to them, to the religious uh, soldiers. Yeah. But it took time to me to understand it. Wow. So it was really hard for me. Yeah. Maybe, Sarah, you can also just touch on some of the morality of the Israeli army. You know, we've mm -hmm. also been through a d difficult summer again. They kind of keep repeating again and again. You know, lots of uh, stuff coming out of Gaza and fires and just there's pressure on the borders of Israel and the Israeli army, the soldiers are active all the time. There's, there's not really a dull moment, it seems like. And it seems like any moves that they make, the international media and around the world, they just attack and they really say lots of nasty things, even though I, from my experience, there is a good heart behind wanting to protect our people, et cetera. Just touch on that a little bit. What do you see as far as the morality of the Israeli army and soldiers? I think the Israeli army, without a doubt, is one of the most moral armies in the world. It's incredible the level of integrity and value for human life that we're trained to serve as and that actually happens despite the terrible tension and intense situations that you find yourself in. Even though most of the soldiers are very young, only 18, 19, 20, 21 years old, it's still ingrained into the very DNA of how we work that human life comes above anything else. And um, for example, one of the biggest moral values that the Army is built around is uh, human life, integrity, and brotherhood that you always fight uh, for our country and we protect our nation no matter what, but we also honor the other side as humans and as people that have lives of their own. And um, for example, I was in the Army during Operation Protective Edge in Gaza in 2014, and we came into Gaza in order to clear out tunnels that had been dug under the border coming up within even cities and villages in Israel. And there were terrorists that were coming into homes and, and they were 
just pop up from under the ground. So we had to go into Gaza to clear out these terrorist um, centers. And as we were there, before we would come in, the airplanes of our IDF would come in and actually just release flyers everywhere, thousands and thousands of flyers in Arabic, warning the people to get out and saying, we're coming in on this day, at this time, be yeah. ready. Wow. There's no other army in the world I know of that would do something like that. Yes, wow, that's incredible. Now, just also maybe, Rafael, you could touch on this. I know there's that tension. You're protecting your people, and it tends to be against the Arabs all the time that you're protecting yourself. What happens to people's hearts in the army towards Arabs and peoples who um, are coming against Israel? Do you see that there's, there tends to be a hardness, or what, what goes on in your heart? Yes, it's, it's really hard because we have our friends, the Arabs' friends, and in the army, the mind is that the, all the Arabs, sometimes they are bad, uh, because you're always around these bad Arabs. Mm -hmm. um, you need a lot of patience. Like for me, it was like a lot of uh, to take a breath and think about it, and not like to all the Arabs, and especially I have uh, my experience in the army was to pray for these Arabs. Mm -hmm. It was really hard. I for doubt, but this is one of the important things that I did uh, in the night. It was hard for me, but it's still I try like <laughs> pray mm -hmm. um, for these Arabs that they can be safe. Uh, but it's really hard, yeah. really hard. Wow. Well, friends, before we jump in, and I have uh, Sarah and Raphael share some key prayer points of how you guys around the world can be joining together with us and praying for soldiers here in Israel and the IDF. I want to ask you again, would you share and like this broadcast? And also, I want to remind you that this Revive Live weekly show is a partnership between Revive Israel and Tikkun International. And we have a weekly email update that we send out every week. It's translated in many different languages. And if you're not receiving it, we'd love for you to sign up. You can go to our website, reviveisrael.org, and there'll be a place there that you can sign up to receive the, our weekly email updates. There's teachings, there's videos, and uh, ways that you can connect with us. We also would love to hear from you. You can write us through this update, share prayer requests with us, what God's doing in your life. And so we look forward to being in touch with you. Okay, guys, let's hear it now. What are key ways that people can be praying for the IDF? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I think first, maybe for the believer soldiers, mm -hmm. that, like Sarah said, we feel lonely. Me too. Yeah. With, because you don't have a believer soldiers around you. Um, so this is the f one of the first things, I think. Um, when to continue yeah. Maybe. Um, so just for God to surround them with His presence, because sometimes it's we all walk through desert seasons where you just yes. can't hear the voice of the Lord. You're questioning His faithfulness. Where are you, God? Why can't I see you? And it's especially hard when you're disconnected from a community and you don't have anyone that is walking through these things with you and, and can encourage you every day. So just for His Spirit to encourage them and to build them up and. In him. That's good. Yeah. You guys you have some more? Um, also, I would say for physical protection, yes. uh, because our soldiers are thrown into urban warfare is the most difficult kind of warfare because you can't, you can never know what window your enemies are hiding behind and just a lot of difficult situations, even the media, like you mentioned, they take the smallest thing and blow it up to look like another world war is breaking out or don't show the other side that's instigating the problem. So protection for our soldiers. Yeah, and for their souls, uh, a lot of people uh, after the army they change, they have um, really traumatic uh, situations that it's really hard to get out from them and they need to go to psychologists and a lot of people to change it. but. They don't understand that they need Jesus and uh, God yeah. to change it. Yeah, that's good. Sometimes you have to harden yourself to a certain level in order to go through the intense yeah. things you're facing. So just for God to keep that tender place. Mm. Yes. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, I think when, I, when I'm you know, serving with a number of young teenagers, some of the young men that I'm discipling and mentoring, they're in the army right now and just getting texts from them sharing about how many sleepless nights they've had and how intense the training was. and 
just functioning on so little energy, so little sleep, and they've just walked 30, 30 kilometers carrying a big backpack and training and yeah. in the mud and the dirt and the food didn't show up on time and they were without water. I'm just like, how are you coping with this day <laughs> after day? It's so intense. And also I think one other thing we could add is just that the gospel would continue to yes. be spread mm -hmm. among the soldiers. It's such yeah. a, a great opportunity when there's those pressures people are feeling lonely going through these challenges, I think people might be more open at times mm -hmm. to f having God come into their lives, yeah. receiving that strength and that support. Yeah. I just sense maybe, Sarah, you could just lead us in prayer as we close mm -hmm. for soldiers. Yeah. And uh, then we can end our time. Yeah. Yes. Father, we thank you that you never sleep nor slumber, that you are the guarder and the protector of Israel and of each one of our nations, God. We bring before you every soldier that's giving their life to serve and to protect us. God, we ask that you would fill them right now with your Holy Spirit, Lord. For those that don't know you, would you open their eyes to see the Messiah and to see the hope and eternal life that you offer, God, that they would not leave this world without knowing you, that they would not miss their destiny and calling to be a light to the nations. God, I ask that your light would shine even in the midst of these dark places, Lord, that even as um, soldiers enter, even Arab villages, that they would bring the light of the gospel, Lord, that you would keep their hearts tender before you, that you would keep every believing soldier's heart in a place of worship and awe and communion of you, God, that you would surround them and be the friend that's closer than a brother, Lord, that you would be a parent and a, a friend and a brother to those who are alone. God, we just send strength and encouragement right now to every heart to trust and to hope in you that you are faithful and you are good and you will keep them till the end. In the name of Yeshua, amen. Amen. It's great. Well, thank you guys. I had a great uh, chat with you today. Yes. Yeah. And thank you guys for joining us on Facebook Live. Also, some of you are watching on YouTube. We're so glad that you joined us for this week's Revive Live, and we look forward to seeing you next week. See you soon.